Hi there, this is a video about these iButton Thermocron temperature uh, data loggers and how what to do with them when the battery dies inside. Now iButtons are commonly seen maybe in weather spoons where they use them to log into their tills but there's also a range that are available to measure and record temperatures and in some cases humidity. For these purposes there is a built-in battery in the unit uh, which obviously after a while stops working. From our experience this tends to happen after about 10 years if the um, logger isn't used very often, even if it's left going or the clock isn't stopped when you're not using it. And 10 years is probably the shelf life of the battery. There are spreadsheets available that let you estimate how long the battery is going to last if you're logging at high te um, temporal resolution. So I've got a couple plugged in here, one of which is working properly and one of which the battery is depleted on. And we can see in the software what happens when your battery dies. So this is the screen you should get when your temperature sensor is plugged in. You should get a description, real-time temperature, clock, memory, file, password, and mission. If I want to read the temperature, the first thing I have to do is check the clock's running. If you halt the clock, it saves the battery. So that's why it's been halted on here. So I synchronise the clock to rear PC. And then if I go on to the real-time temperature tab, it should load up the current temperature on the right here on this bar, and it will gradually draw a line across the screen. On the mission tab, you can set up how often it's going to take a temperature using this screen here. Now if we look at the other eye button, which has a depleted battery, we can see we get different tabs up here. We get real-time humidity and A to D, as well as the tabs we were getting before. And it reports itself as a DS1922-1923-DS42 And that's because um, the part number, the precise part number of the logger is only identified by something that's written into the random access memory that can't be read when the battery is depleted. This 41 at the start of the serial number, or the end, depending on which way round it's displayed, uh, will tell, tell it that it's one of this series, but not which variant it is. If I try and go into real-time temperature, well, actually, I need to start the clock first. It seems to be started already. We'll see we get an error message when it tries to read the temperature. Which mean, means either the battery is depleted or um, the memory is um, password protected. You can check whether the problem is the uh, there's a password been set on the device or the battery is depleted by going into the memory tab here selecting scratch pad with CRC and password and then if you still get a error message it means that the battery is dead because that uh, scratch pad isn't password protected so it should be able to read it even if there's a password on the device. So now on to what I do to rejuvenate these I buttons where the battery's died. Firstly you need to get inside the device and maybe the the most obvious way of doing this is to prise out the data contact with all the serial numbers on it from the main part of the I button, which is what I've done here. However, this tends to be very destructive of the case if you can't use the case anymore. So my preferred method is to cut round, or basically to file off that rim on the bottom where, the, where it clips into its holder. This is very quick to do, I've got about 100 of these to do, so I need to do them quite quickly. You just file around that edge there, as I'll show you in this next clip of video. And the bottom, or the top, depending on what you want to call it, of the eye button, then comes off. Once you've got inside, the innards will just lift out of the I button and you'll find there's a circuit board with a piece of plastic and a battery inside. 
you'll see there's a contact sticking up, which makes contact with the data um, part of the I button, this part with the writing on it. And on the other side, that contact for the battery will also um, connect to the um, rest of the can, which is the ground. You'll see here that the battery is actually spot welded onto those contacts. On the other side we have a circuit board with the temperature sensor which just slides into that piece of plastic under those contacts like that. I've been soldering to this one which is why it's got big blobs on it. That side's got the temperature sensor, the other side's got all the um, circuitry trips, chips on it. And here again now we can see the other side of the battery with another spot welded contact onto it in the middle there. So these contacts on the left you've got the data contact which just goes to the I button case and the circuit board. In the middle you've got the battery plus and on the right hand side you've got the battery minus. Using a sharp knife it's possible to cut those spot welded contacts off of the battery like that and you could just put a new battery in. However, then you'd be reliant on the pressure on the battery, um, which is a potential point of unreliability, and all the memory contents are lost because it's SRAM. If the battery becomes disconnected, you lose all your log data. The battery is a BR1225. BR is a version for low drain applications, uh, long life low drain. And this energizer battery, although it doesn't say it's a BR1225, it is actually if you look at the battery there. Um, the 12 is the battery diameter in millimeters, and the 25 is the battery thickness in uh, tenths of a millimeter. So your replacement battery options there's the energizer 1225, and there's a Panasonic. BR1225, which I believe is the original um, specification. If we look at this the original battery, it's a Panasonic. And the Panasonic battery is available from RS components with that part number 7450929. So I thought what I'd do was abandon this original battery holder and circuit board holder and solder onto the circuit board and the I button case what we got here one of my refurbished things and then I could have an external battery holder and I could change the battery when I wanted to. The problem is you can't solder to the uh, I button case because it's stainless steel so the um, solution I found to this was to spot weld to it. Here I've got one of the scrap pieces of case and I've spot welded a bit of nickel to it and you can get cheap slightly dodgy um, spot welding rigs on eBay which I feature in none of my videos so I'll just show you now how you'd spot weld a, little, a couple of little pieces of nickel onto your case in order to have something to solder to. Okay so I'll just do a demo weld for you here I don't know if the insulation and gloves are strictly necessary just like to fix the whole thing if you hold your clothes down onto the metal at an angle and a couple of millimeters apart then I press my foot to pitch and it, the machine should beep a couple of times and then do the weld. Of course make sure my clothes are nowhere near the edge of the can or they'll just sort of dart across to there as well. So there we go. The clothes slightly stick to the metal, they slightly weld themselves down onto the metal strip. But then we find, if you look at the piece of nickel strip, you can see the two little indentations where it's welded through onto the can and that is securely welded in place, I can't get it off. And then I would just spot weld another piece of nickel onto the side as the other contact. That's the data contact on that middle um, part of the I button and then the outside of the can is ground. Here I've got one of my wired up I buttons. Uh, ready for reassembly. You can see here the pieces of nickel silver that have been spot welded to the data contact and the ground on the side there. I use thin 24 or 26 American wire gauge 
wire wrapping wire which is quite fine and useful for this. So now I need to reassemble all this into the case. I just put some uh, insulation tape over both sides of the circuit board so I can't short out on anything and over those contacts and then pack it all up in here with some uh, epoxy resin glue. Here are a couple of the completed items where it's all been packed in and glued together. I've got a couple of different types of battery holder here. I think the brown one is better because it holds the battery more firmly, um, <coughs> although it makes it more difficult to get the battery in and out. These black holders, if you press down on the battery slightly, which you're likely to do when you push it into the um, reader, the battery tends to become disconnected and you lose everything. In view of this, I decided to make some cases up for these eye buttons as well. Uh, these are simply a small ABS box which I drill and make a hole in. And then I can push the eye button into that hole. It's quite a tight fit. And then I'm going to put some um, rubbers in there just to hold it in place and screw the lid on. So when your eye button's all nicely cased up like that, you're not going to be able to disconnect the um, battery easily. So that's good. And that'll just plug onto the reader, as I say. If I plug one of these refurbished eye buttons into the reader, we'll see I get a slightly different variation of the tabs, which we saw before. I get the extra A to D tab, but I don't get the real-time humidity tab. And it thinks the device is a DS. 2422, which is the underlying chipset on which all these Thermocron um, data loggers, the DS1922 and 1923, are based. Uh, but it doesn't know whether it's a DS1922 or 1923. It thinks it's this generic uh, chipset version <coughs> because, it, again, it's missing the data from the SRAM which it's lost when its battery's been flat. We've still got the 41 in the serial number which tells it that it's that uh, model family. And the A to D tab is for a second A to D conversion part of the circuitry which is on the chipset but isn't used in the DS1922 I button. It is used in the DS1923 where it's used for the humidity circuitry. So I can start the clock running on this I button and then it'll all work. The temperature should report now. And I can start a new mission, which you'll see has some different options from what you'd see on your normal DS1922 I button. You've got this temperature part, which is the normal. But then you've got this mission channel data, which is for the second channel. So when you're using this I button, you'd need to disable that because it's not going to be doing anything useful other than consuming memory space. Unfortunately, you can't write back the calibration data or the precise model data into the uh, I button. Uh, the precise model number is, is in the SRAM, but is in an area that you can't um, write to. If you try writing to it, it'll immediately revert back to its old version when it's next read because it hasn't actually written it. And uh, therefore, because you can't store the model number, it's always going to default to not using the custom calibration data. So I did some tests on the I buttons. Um, I, I had a, a sample of about 10 of the refurbished ones, uh, some new DS1922s and some older 1922s, uh, just to see how badly not having the calibration data affects the um, temperature accuracy of the device. Uh, so I put about 10 of the refurbished ones without the cases and new eye buttons and old second hand ones which the battery was still working on a tray, put them at room temperature and in the oven at low temperature and in the fridge and the freezer and got this trace out which you can clearly see my refurbished eye buttons tend to slightly underread by maybe one degree depending uh, compared to the mean of the uh, new ones. That's at logging at half degree uh, C resolution. And similarly, this graph is logging at 0.0625 degrees C resolution. 
So generally there's a slight underread, but nothing uh, major when you compare it to the spread of the results anyway for my buttons. It's not too bad. A few more pictures uh, in the report just for interest. This is my spot welding setup with this cheap spot welder on eBay, which I talk about in another video. There's the charger for it, my lithium polymer battery, my spot welding probes, and this foot switch to trigger it with. Here's some modifications I do to the spot welder, which I'll talk about in the other video. Here's my cased up eye button. Here's my wiring, which you've seen, and the types of battery holders. And this is a strip down of eye buttons in different uh, stages of stripping them down. And that's your uh, contacts on the eye button. And these is just the summary of the tabs you see. So in a functioning eye button uh, thermocron, you get these uh, tabs. If the battery's failed, you get these extra real-time humidity and A to D tabs. And after you've replaced the battery, you then don't get the real-time humidity tab, but you still get the A to D tab. Uh, so hopefully that's been useful for some people who want to refurbish their eye buttons. I've seen other um, reports of people cutting them open, usually in some awful way, which completely ruins them. But no one's really ever talked about the... Uh, software issues and remember after you've refurbished your eye button you have to restart the real-time clock before you can get the temperature monitoring to work thanks for watching